Nottingham Trent University. Working with you. Proud sponsors of Working Week. working week this week. How the City Council and the construction industry are working together to find jobs for people in Nottingham. It's professional services such as quantity surveyors, engineers and so forth uh, and you've got uh, other skills such as uh, your tradespeople such as joiners, bricklayers uh, and, and labourers. So there's, there's a shortage across the board really and we need more people to enter careers in construction. And we've got a new tram line, we've got the A453 finally being dueled so what's next for transport here in Notts? There is a step change that needs to take place, in my view. Um, we need to recognise that um, big infrastructure, however it's financed, whether it's financed locally or whether it's financed through traditional means, um, is a sort of geological process. It's about pressure over time. And little Asa here is going to enjoy the next piece, which is all about a group of people who are teaching the traditional skills, Des, of upholstering, stuffing to you. Stuffing. Yeah, I knew you'd say that. You'd be amazed what we talk about in class. We've put the world to rights and people just come and do a little bit of creativity um, and we have a good old chat as well, so it's, it's really good fun. Hello, I'm Rob Pitton. And I'm Des Coleman. First of all, Rob, why don't we talk about jobs? Yeah, this is one of our favourite topics, creating jobs around Nottingham and Nottinghamshire. And you might have noticed, Des, the construction industry around here has gone through a bit of a boom. So it's joined up with our city council to help train people to make sure they can get the jobs that are being created right now. There's a construction boom going on all over Nottingham. And now the challenge is to make sure the jobs it's churning out go to local people and that the contracts go to not businesses too. The City Council and the Construction Industry Training Board have teamed up to come up with what they call a joint investment strategy. The economy has picked up, so there's a high demand for construction services out there. Part of the problem with this is the, there's actually a skill shortage at the moment. Uh, and so the joint investment strategy, uh, part of the remit of that is to support the industry to overcome this challenge by supporting the industry to recruit new people and retain some of those people who are in the industry within the sector. The scheme is a £1 million project administered from the Jobs Hub at Nottingham City Council. First of all, it provides training and jobs advice for people looking for work. Nottingham has quite a high percentage of unemployed people at the moment and we're offering an opportunity for those people that are interested in construction to do pre-employment training courses that are designed to remove all the barriers that exist from entering that career. But with so much building work going on, the scheme is also looking at employers, offering them training in how to grow their business and how to take people on, with courses worth up to £2,500 being offered for free. Anyone looking for advice should get in touch with Nathan at the City Council. We have a portfolio of courses available that are fully funded through our programme that are designed to support the future leaders, managers and directors of business um, to acquire those skills that they feel they're more comfortable to take on apprentices and to increase their labour. Business owner John Johnson knows both sides of the story. He's built his company up from nothing. Local lad from the Radford area. I was out of work, had a family to support, so I had to get a job. I decided to do the plan of the market of the Princess Trust side uh, and came through there, you know, and it's a, a lot of sacrifice. I remember four years I didn't take a wage. Um, and now I'm in the position where I'm employing 10 people and we're hopefully going to build on, but it's getting the right people now to do that. And I want to give the chance to other people in Nottingham area to come and work for us and build up the Nottingham area. Now John employs a dozen people and is using the scheme to find more staff. The issue is finding the right people in the construction that follow our beliefs, our core values and has the right skills involved to do the job properly. Unfortunately, it's so hard to get them at this present time. So hopefully with the joint investment um, strategy with, with Nathan, we can pull in some more people and give them that chance. There's no end in sight to the construction boom in Knotts or to the demand for workers to keep it going. So if you're looking for a job in the construction industry or a business looking to get a share of the action, get in touch with the City Council for more help. 
<laughs> Someone else, you know. <laughs> How do you do it? I don't know, mate. But they're walking, and when you walk, you travel, and when you travel, you sort of transport yourself somewhere. Exactly. How do they all get into Nottingham, and what are their transport problems and their, their transport bonuses, the things they like about travelling in the city? You've been finding out. Certainly have. I think they're great. I'm not a, um, a great user of public transport. I tend to stick to, to the trams, but um, I've got no complaints. They run on time. They're, they're clean, they're reasonably priced, so yeah, no complaints. If you come in a car, you have to join these major route systems rather than be able to go left or right because of the bus lanes. But the bus lanes are a, a really good advantage. But they still are trying to make the traffic as uncomfortable as possible. So you decide that there's no option. So they're not really improving much for the transport. They're just causing the problem. So we need the transport. See, that's the voice of the people of Nottingham. Uh, but what is next for Nottingham Transport? Yeah, well, we thought we'd catch up with Councillor Nick MacDonald. We've interviewed him a few times, and he's the guy in charge of dreaming up the new transport okay. schemes and making sure they work. If you remember Line 1 being built, you know, it was four months delayed. People forget that. Um, and when it opened, um, a lot of the, the protest and a lot of the naysaying quickly turned into support and, more importantly, turned into usage. And, you know, I live on Line 1, I get the tram every day, it's packed, it's a great way to travel into the city, it's convenient, it's accessible, it's affordable. We have to remember that Nottingham has 57% car usage as opposed to 74%, I think, nationally. That tells you something, actually. It tells you that a tram system is about connecting people to their city, about giving them the ability to move around the city. And in a city with deprivation like Nottingham, it's particularly important. So um, I think now that we're at the end of net phase two, I think we'll see the same thing that we saw with line one, which is people recognising that, you know, when you, all you can see is roadworks and you can't get into the town, um, of, course, of course it's difficult, disruptive and annoying and frustrating. Once it's finished and you can jump on a fantastic tram and you can have a smooth ride sweeping through Beast and sweeping past QMC up into the city, people will feel differently about it, of course they will, because it'd be a great way for them to get into town. The way in which big infrastructure will be financed I think will change over the next few years, I think it has to. Um, you look at um, cities in Europe uh, and elsewhere in the world and they have a much more uh, progressive way of thinking about developing the infrastructure uh, in their cities and you know it's, it's fundamentally about having local control uh, and being trusted to drive your city forwards. You know, and this used to happen in the UK, you know, when, in Birmingham where they built the great sewer, sewer system you know, in the late 19th century, they didn't ask permission from central government to do that, they got on with it because they had the, the tools, the mechanisms to do it. We don't have that now, we have a very centralised form of government, I think that needs to change. I think um, we did very well in this city in getting the funding we needed to build lines one, two and three. Um, I think I'd like to hope that in the future um, we'll have the ability to make that sort of decision for ourselves. Well, I like to give a little bit extra, uh, ask any of my girlfriends, haha. <laughs> um, but on working week, we like to give a bit extra as well. Yeah, I'm just working out if we can get away with that. I think we will. Nobody <laughs> noticed. We'll just carry on. Yeah, we featured the um, chocolate maker out in Clifton a few weeks ago. And what we didn't have time to show you at the time was the fact that he trained with someone very famous, Heston Blumenthal, of all people. And we thought what he had to say was quite interesting. So here are his recollections of working with that famous chef. I remember searching Heston one day on Google when I got through to his fat duck and I was just having a, like, a quick route round at his website having a look round. And at the time there was accepting uh, stagia, as they call it in, in the industry, which is work experience. You go there to learn. And Heston, you have to spend a minimum of a month and you go around all the sections to do with fat duck. So I just sent my CV and a bit about myself to the HR lady and then she emailed me back straight away with some questions about food. I emailed them back and then she accepted me. She gave me three different dates and then I chose the date that I could do and then I, I went there and done it. I uh, worked on several different departments throughout the Fat Duck. It was an amazing time as well, a really good time. Heston Blumenthal is a really, really nice person. Uh, he's got a fantastic team. Uh, they're all fantastic uh, and they're just so knowledgeable there. They know a lot about a lot of different things and they're not scared to tell you and help you. And the head chef, Johnny Lake, he's, um, he's very knowledgeable and very, um, very gives his time to you, very polite and, and the way that he explains things and, and that sort of thing. Very, very good place to work, very good place. <laughs> It's not just Coco Pod, though, which has links with celebrities. Look at the names on this wall of fame. It's at one of Nottingham's longest-established Indian restaurants, the Mughal Iyazam. 
Perhaps it's not surprising given its location for hungry performers just around the corner from Rock City, the Theatre Royal and the Concert Hall. You name it, Bill Bailey, Billy Connolly, Jane McDonald, David Essex, every name you, well, whoever comes in the theatre, they're always here. Strangely, no picture of Des yet. And for Curry House celebrity spotters, this isn't the place where Chris Tarrant famously enjoyed a bit of horseplay with customers back in 2007. That was, well, would you like to phone a friend? Final answer? That's right, the equally well-established Memsab. Well, that's it for this half, but as you see, Des has been nobbled by someone he knows here. So what's happening, isn't it, Des? Did you interview each other? Yes. Yeah. No, no, he, uh, Des, Des interviewed me. Oh, and you're and still talking a... to him? Yes, it was an honour because I remember him from... <laughs> oh, an like honour, we don't hear that very often. Well, that's it for now, but when we come <laughs> back, Des's head will be even bigger and we'll be reporting on a group of people teaching craft skills here in Nottingham. <laughs> We're always looking for not only students but tutors. Any tutors out there that are interested in teaching some creative subjects, that's what we'd love to offer. We'd love to expand. We've just started crochet. We've got all sorts of furniture, restoration and painting here. And we'll be looking at the business making money out of promoting our heritage. Nice one. That's the beauty of heritage is you can do creative projects that cover a range of, of things. So. Uh, creative writing, even marketing, accounting, all that stuff is included in what we do. And we'll be seeing a place I popped into the other day. It was oh. a, a bead shop, would you believe? And I just found it so fascinating how an independent that. shop like that just survives and keeps going despite all the competition. The, the magnificent selection, isn't it? It's just superb. We go mad. <laughs> That's it. See you later. Nottingham Trent University, proud sponsors of Working Week. Nottingham Trent University, proud sponsors of Working Week. Ha. Welcome back to Working Week. Yep, and in this half we'll be looking at the people teaching traditional craft skills, craft skills, <laughs> traditional craft skills like upholstery. Age ranges from sort of late teens to well into 70s and everybody comes in has a really good time working on individual projects, depending on their skill. So you're going to measure it? Shall I pin that in first? Yes, pin that one in first. Yeah. And the Nottingham-based business that's preserving our heritage around the country. Lovely. You look like you were going to sing a song to me then. Did I, mate? Yeah, I'm good. Heritage! No. <laughs> Here it comes. This weekend we're going to Edinburgh to survey for a historical reenactment for a, a large consultancy in London. Um, so it's, it's just starting to take off and it's, it's word of mouth. And we'll be popping into the Nottingham Bead Shop, which is just up there around the corner near Debenhams, actually, to find out how an independent store like them can survive and thrive. Make sure you diversify, you embrace social media, start having videos, give a lot away a lot more free content and projects and help so that you can differentiate yourself from your competitors. All that to come. Now, next up is a very interesting film. Yeah, this is one our cameraman actually enjoyed filming. We don't say that very wow. often, do we? He doesn't enjoy much in life when it comes to, to filming. I think we've got away with it so far. But this is a group of people who set up a, a school to teach people those traditional crafts of things like upholstery. It's a classic case of the private sector providing what the public sector no longer does. Although in this case it's in the rather unusual field of evening classes. Once scenes like this were common in schools and colleges across the country. Adults learning skills and hobbies away from the world of work. Now though, they're disappearing rapidly. OK, Hilary, so what you need to be doing now is what we call a tea cut. When Naomi Wagstaff so lost her job teaching corner, soft furnishings and upholstery at a Nottingham so college, she decided to set up her own venture, passing on her knowledge as a teacher, but running it as a business. Can you see how that forms a tea? Yeah. So that's the fold, the top of the tea, and the tea comes up to there. Upholstery and soft furnishings, I teach 10-week courses, which at the moment are non-vocational. Students just work individually on their own projects, and they're rolling courses, so if something takes longer than 10 weeks, there's the facility to roll on to the next course and so on. So larger projects may take a year, uh, a year's course, so that's where we're currently at. Um, but I'm really pleased to say that from January 
Secretary, we're going to be able to offer accredited courses with City and Guilds starting at level two, and that will be in upholstery and soft furnishings and pattern cutting, and then hopefully moving on to um, a more advanced level three. So uh, we're really delighted to do that. So this end is going to be flush. Deirdre Robbins helped Naomi to set the courses up. It's been two years now, and for the last year, the business has been operating out of a studio in St Anne's, and the students are learning fast. Make sure you've got all your pattern pieces in the right place. Okay. And make sure you've got your straight grain. People come for all sorts of reasons. So sometimes they'll come because they want to learn a particular thing. They have a particular project in mind. They might want to make something for their house or some garments. Sometimes they want to start a small business so they might have some basic skills and they want to improve that and, and start a business. And sometimes they just do it for just the sheer pleasure of learning. Some people just like to learn and, and do things and acquire skills and build their skills up. So Calvin, well done. You've managed to strip it all down. Took a while. Very, yeah, very uh, time consuming. I'm but, sure it um, is. I'm sure it is. But what the atmosphere at the studio is different to a college course. It's relaxed and there's no stress of exams at the end. Make sure you keep a nice straight line. I think the great thing about here is we're totally independent, so we haven't got the, uh, the paperwork regime that comes with a lot of colleges. We've not got the hoops to jump through like colleges have. So um, students feel very relaxed because uh, they haven't got to follow a specific criteria. They're just coming for fun and actually learning the skills that we offer. For the students, it's a chance to follow a hobby or a dream, putting together their own individual furniture or creating a dress design that's unique. I've been coming a year, or well, just over a year last summer. I'm doing the fashion course. I make my own 1940s reproduction clothing. I learn something every week, because when I started, I've retired now, and I only got schoolgirl sewing, which I thought was adequate. I thought, oh, I'll progress a little bit. So I came along to Deirdre about a year ago, even something simple like putting a zip in. I was doing it all wrong. This is a really old fabric. It's called double-faced fabric, so it's quite thick. And the pattern was an authentic 1940s pattern that with help in the class I managed to alter to fit me. So I'm really thrilled with it and everybody thinks it's the real thing. It's, it's very special because it has uh, squared sleeves. It's not a normal, it's not a normal sleeve, it's uh, a square one. So it's quite, quite different to the everyday stuff. So nobody else has got this, this is unique, <laughs> which is really exciting. Put the first coat on and then we're going to go over it just with a lighter colour. It's going to be something similar to the, to the drawers there. Now the studio is looking to expand and offer a wider range of courses, many of which have disappeared from the curriculum of evening classes across Nottinghamshire. We're always looking for not only students but tutors. Any tutors out there that are interested in teaching some creative subjects, that's what we'd love to offer. Um, we'd love to expand. Um, we've, we've just started crochet. Um, we've got all sorts of furniture, uh, restoration and, and painting here. And uh, we'd like to do that, you know, even maybe photography or something like that. There might be somebody out there that's interested in coming and joining us and, uh, and offering that as well. So um, it'd be just perfect to be a creative hub uh, just outside the city here. The squeeze on public spending means colleges are cutting back on courses like these, but there's clearly no lack of demand from people wanting to try their hand at a hobby or a craft. And this is one private venture that's hoping to step in and fill that gap in the market. Lovely, so that's the finishing touch. That looks amazing, well done. Next, let's catch up with what's going on at the Hive Incubation Centre. Yeah, this is a place we've featured a few times, set up by Nottingham Trent University with the aim of encouraging people to set up business, not just its students, but pretty much anyone in Nottingham who's got a good business yeah. idea. We featured some of the firms that are based there. Let's see this one. This is a company which makes money out of our love of British heritage. So we do all sorts of exciting things. Uh, heritage is really broad in what you can do. You can do everything from kids' workshops all the way up to um, Heritage Lottery Fund grants and data collection and things. So it's a really exciting field to be in. I think what surprised us is the dedication of the heritage sector and the students and just the enthusiasm for using projects to benefit the community and things. It's always one of those things that you do the project and you think it's, it's going to be great, you know, so, so many people will benefit from it. But then when you actually see the enthusiasm of the volunteers that are working on things um, and the staff that are working on it, then it's, it's really special. 
Here's an idea that uh, you had. I don't have many, but this is one of my <laughs> ideas, yes. Well, I popped into a bead shop just around the corner from here a couple of days ago, yeah. and I was fascinated by the way an independent shop like that is surviving despite all the competition, and I thought there was a lesson there for anyone who runs a business like that. It's been a tough few years for independent shops, and the ones which have survived the recession have had to work hard. The bead shop on Market Street in Nottingham is still going strong, but it's done it by constantly expanding its market and always looking for new ways to reach out to customers. We do lots and lots of different things, particularly trying to encourage other people to do their own stuff as well, because particularly when the economic climate sort of took a dip, um, it was a lot of people coming in to either fix jewellery that was broken rather than buying brand new, um, which also led us into um, creating our restringing service, which is one of probably our most popular um, services at the moment. So lots of people bringing in much-loved items to be fixed rather than you know buying brand new again. And it's also led people on to realising, oh, I could do this for myself, doing our workshops. Our workshops are run um, almost weekly at the moment, and again, we take a lot of influence from what customers want to learn. There's also a heavy emphasis on selling over the internet, with up to 100 orders a day going out. But even that side of the business has been heavy going too. Retail has been tough, particularly the last five years. There's been, it's been difficult. Initially it was just the retail side of it that was difficult, so we could compensate by doing more on the internet. But in the last couple of years, all business has been really tough. You have to fight a lot harder. How do you do that? I mean, is there a big book that says how to get through the internet? No. <laughs> oh, that, would, that would be marvellous. That would be really helpful. But no, we've just had to, to really work hard, make sure that we keep on top of what everyone wants, take on board all the customer feedback that we get. We've had to reduce staffing numbers, which has been hard work and difficult. They're just a, a bit dark, but yeah. Yeah. can't be helped. Hannah set up the business 16 years ago. She had been planning on going to university, but got bitten by the retail bug. I was 18. I was taking a year out before going to university. I was working for a different bead shop that used to be in Nottingham, and they decided to move to Somerset, so there was a gap in the market. And since I was quite little watching Mr. Ben episodes, I always wanted to be a shopkeeper. Um, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do with a degree. I got a place at Nottingham to study chemistry and biology, but I didn't really want to go into the field. So it seemed like a, a good business opportunity. The shop sells a huge array of beads and for customers, it's the only place for miles around that can meet their needs. This is my first visit. Um, we're from Derby and um, it's a fantastic shop and uh, I should be coming often but uh, this is my first visit. What, did you come from Derby specifically for this then? M yes, partly, yes. This is one other call, yes. What have you liked about it? The, the magnificent selection, isn't it? It's just superb. You could go mad. <laughs> what, are, what are you going to do with all these bees then? Um, well, I, I make them up and sell them. The bead shop's hoping that the recession is being left behind and it's now looking forward to growing again, although it won't be easy. So does Hannah regret not taking that place at university? No, I did do a year of a silversmithing degree uh, while running the shop. Um, so I did experience a bit of university and I, I love what I learned, but I, I don't miss all the going out drinking and, uh, <laughs> and then deadlines and that side of it. I'm glad that... I did this, but it definitely wasn't the easier choice that I once thought it was. <laughs> That's it, end of series four. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think they'll have us back, Rob? Well, we'll probably catch it on a rerun yeah. somewhere. <laughs> yeah, but hopefully we'll be back with series five very shortly. And in the meantime, if you've got a business in Nottingham or Nottinghamshire yes. and want to be on this programme, let us know. Get in touch. We're not that scary, are we? No. No. <laughs>